Up until last week, we didn't know much about the DLC. In fact, we knew... <laughs> but now we know that the DLC entrance is here, in Mogwin Palace, before Mikola's withered arm. I think it could be important to understand the circumstances of Mikola's death here, at the hands of Moog, so let's dive in. Onos. As the age of the Erd Tree began, Moog was born of the union between Queen Marika and Lord Godfrey. Godfrey was the first Elden Lord, and as such, Moog is one of the oldest demigods, alongside his siblings, who were Morgoth and Godwin. Moog and Morgoth were twins, born together and born as Omen, placing them in stark contrast to their brother Godwin, who was the golden child, so to speak. Omen, like Moog and Morgoth on the other hand, were considered to be cursed. But what are the Omen? Skip this chapter if you've heard it all before, but I think the Omen are born by chance, sprouting these grotesque horns that are vestiges of the primordial crucible. So what is the crucible? The crucible is a melting pot of life that existed before the Erd Tree, and its energies are actually what became the Erd Tree. It's here that there was this blending of many creatures' physiological aspects, like feathers, tail, knot, scale, fang, and horn. What's truly noteworthy about these aspects is that they would sometimes come to grow on creatures that weren't supposed to have them. For example, kill a deer or sheep, or even an ancestral follower in the lands between, and there's a tiny chance that you'll receive a budding horn, which I think are not unlike the horns of the omen. The budding horn reads, this horn began to sprout on a beast that typically bears no horn. Perhaps it is a vestige of the primordial crucible. According to the crucible talismans, there was a time when these aspects, like horns, were once considered signifiers of the divine. And that makes some sense, because these aspects stem from the crucible, which did become the Erd Tree, so why wouldn't they be considered holy? And so it's during this time that we have to assume that the ancient warriors known as the Crucible Knights were knighted, serving Lord Godfrey and fighting with many aspects of the Crucible, including horn, tail, breath, and even wing. But fast forward to the current age and the Crucible Knights are lost, scattered all over the lands between, fighting for different causes or for no cause at all. And that's because Queen Marika's Golden Order abandoned them. The Crucible Gauntlets reveal that, in time, the strength shown by these knights, and even their appearance, came to be looked upon with scorn for having such close resemblance to chaos. This matches a wider trend in Marika's Golden Order, where things were moving away from chaos and the Crucible, and even the Erd Tree, and towards fundamentalism instead as the Age of the Erd Tree progressed. But the Crucible Knights got off easy, all things considered. Take these creatures, for example. Previously, they were seen as divine for having aspects of the Crucible at birth, but eventually they came to be called Misbegotten instead, a word that really sends the vibe that these were now seen as contemptible creatures bearing ill-gotten gains. The Misbegotten became seen as impure, a fact revealed by the spirit ashes of Perfuma Tricia, who was a healer who dedicated her efforts to treating Misbegotten and the Omen as well. The Omen and the Misbegotten certainly needed treatment, as many of them suffered these grievous wounds as a result of their horns being cut off. Those responsible for these wounds in particular were the Omen Killers, a sect of Landell butchers who had full authority to hunt the omen and amputate their horns. So, in my opinion, the tradition of cutting off omen horns would have begun because horns are the offending part of the omen, as they represent their link to the primordial crucible, which is something that became this accursed concept. And 
Omen do bear more aspects of the Crucible than just horns. Moog has a set of wings, just like the Misbegotten, and Morgoth might as well, though they're only really rigged in his animation files. Instead, Morgoth has a tail, just like the Crucible Knights. All that said, the defining aspect of the Omen are definitely the horns. That, and their brute strength, were enough to label them as Omen. Distinct from the Misbegotten, but still born by chance, though many omen were apparently born directly from the Erd Tree's royal line. Two of the darkest items in the game are the omen ban and the regal omen ban. The word ban means child, and these items are dolls. They're fetishes that were fashioned to memorialize omen children who are dead or who might as well be. The omen ban's description reads, Omen babies have all their horns excised, causing most to perish, and those that survive live alongside those memorialized by the regal omen ban, which reads, Omen babies born of royalty do not have their horns excised, but instead are kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone, imprisoned for eternity. So some concessions were made for omen, as opposed to the misbegotten, Two Omen children, Moog and Morgoth, were after all a part of the Golden Lineage, so the Royal Omens weren't mutilated, as long as their horns were out of mind and out of sight. And speaking of sight, a horn seems to be responsible for Moog literally being half blind, as it has grown relentlessly into his eye socket. Incidentally, there's a bit of a trend with blind characters in Elden Ring, and in other From Software games as well, and it's that those blinded are, ironically, able to see what sighted folk cannot. For example, in Elden Ring, it was the exiled prophets who accurately foresaw the flame of ruin burning down the Erd Tree, and it was the guilty, their eyes gouged by thorns, who glimpsed an outer god in the darkness. There are lots of examples, so I guess coincidentally or not, Moog, half blind and wounded, eventually did come to stand before an outer god of his own as well. And he met her deep underground. This outer god was called the Formless Mother, and the Mother of Truth, a fitting choice for the omen whose true mother had abandoned him. We've talked about Outer Gods in other videos, but long story short, they're these cosmic Lovecraftian entities that are at once extremely powerful, but also strangely limited in how they can influence events in the Lands Between. Instead of getting involved directly, they will often commune through envoys or vessels, and in the case of the Formless Mother, her subject of communion, or one of them at least, was Moog. The Blood Boon incantation describes Moog's meeting with this outer god. It reads, The Mother of Truth craves wounds. When Moog stood before her, deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. The text also describes what happens when you cast this incantation. You thrust your arm into the body of the formless mother, then scatter the blood flame to set the area ablaze. So, there's a lot to break down with this one description, but let's start with the fact that this outer god is at once both the formless mother and the mother of truth. So what exactly do these titles mean? Let's start with the formless mother, because I feel like that title is easier to rationalize. She is likely formless because liquid blood is her essence. And incidentally, the word formless is also used to describe the dragon communion seal in Elden Ring, which is also made of blood. But let's cast our net beyond Elden Ring to Bloodborne, where an extremely relevant parallel to the Formless Mother exists in the character of Formless Erden, which is also an outer god of sorts. The Erden Carol rune states that blood is the essence of the Formless Great One, Erden, and 
While I absolutely think that the universes of Bloodborne and Elden Ring are separate, I'm confident that From Software are reusing a concept from Bloodborne here in Elden Ring. So it is that I'm confident that blood is also the essence of the Formless Mother. That said, the Formless Mother still has a body of sorts. We thrust our arm cross-dimensionally into it when we cast Blood Boon, and when we rip our arm out, we scatter not just blood, but blood flame. Thus, while I think the Formless Mother absolutely has an affinity for any blood, I think her essence is, more accurately, blood flame. And she's not the only outer god with a flame of her own. The Fell God has Giant's Flame. Death has Black Flame and Ghost Flame. Frenzy has Frenzy Flame, and you could even theorize that the Greater Will has the golden fire that spews from the mouth of the Elden Beast and Placidusax. So, flame is commonly a sign of an outer god's essence, and I think the Formless Mother is no different, with a blood flame that continues to threaten rupture on those afflicted long after it touches their flesh. The Formless Mother's other title is the Mother of Truth, and this title is a lot harder to interpret. The Mother of Truth. What truth? The only character that we know of that the Mother of Truth has appeared before is Moog, so we're kind of forced to judge her character through his. And while I guess it's possible that the Mother of Truth venerates the absolute truth, or a broader truth, the fact that she chooses to act through Moog is at least a little bit telling. We know that she bestows power upon accursed blood, and I think this preference for accursed blood might be a part of the truth that she represents. I think she might prefer to act through those who are unfairly cursed, like the Omen, like Moog. And I say unfairly cursed because that's kind of what curses are always in From Software games. Curses are always the domain of the gods, and they're always delivered pretty heavy-handedly. Take Dark Souls, for example, where Gwyn, a god, refused to relinquish his Age of Fire, opting instead to curse humanity with undeath, so that they might fuel his fire until the world turns to ash. Pretty over the top, right? And Queen Marika is actually very similar to Gwyn, in that she's a god who arrogantly thinks her order is perfect, to the point where she'll do anything to try and preserve it. Her hubris is alluded to in the Mending Rune of Perfect Order description, which states that the current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of the gods no better than men. And it's this same hubris that led to the scorn of the Crucible, and I think the curse upon the Omen as well. To make things even more unfair for the Omen, their curse appears to largely be one of perception, of hate. The Omen Bairn description conflates these two things, and speaks from the perspective of an Omen child who pleads, please don't hate me, or curse me, please. I also think this notion of curses being unfair is explored further in the Dung Eaters questline, where the Dung Eater goes around defiling others and spreading the Omen curse. He calls this defilement his cursed blessing, because if he defiles everyone, in the end, everyone will be cursed, and therefore no one will be. Thus, in his ending, a sort of cursed justice is restored to the world. Elden Ring has this consistent theme where characters turn their curse into their strength, and I think the Dung Eater and Moog are perfect examples of that. And this is just my theory, but I think the Mother of Truth might bestow power upon the accursed, because the truth is that curses of the gods are unfairly given. There should be nothing wrong with being born with omen horns, right? It's just this genetic trait, a vestige of the primordial crucible that was once even considered divine. But thanks to the Golden Order, these creatures are now considered omens instead. So. I'd like to argue that 
this unfairness is why the Mother of Truth bestows power upon accursed blood. But of course, this is just my theory and I welcome any challenges to it in the comments. I think challenging each other respectfully is how we can get a bit closer to the truth. Speaking of, I saw arguments ages ago that stated that the formless mother is responsible for the curse of the omen. But I'd like to challenge that idea. I'm not sure it can be correct. For one, it's stated that Moog first stood before the formless mother underground, and he was only down here because he was already banished here for being omen, so he must have been omen before this meeting. What's more, when he did stand before her, it's stated that his accursed blood erupted with fire. Thus, his blood was already accursed when it erupted with fire. Finally, it says Moog was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. Thus, he was born Omen, like all of the other Omen children, born to be shunned in a wretched mire underground. But I think there's a reason that people argue that the Formless Mother created the Omen, and I think one of the arguments is that Morgot, Moog's brother, also has blood flame attacks, just like his brother. So I think people reason that blood flame is therefore synonymous with having accursed blood and that all omen have it. But that's not true, because only Moog and Morgoth seem to have blood that was set ablaze. It's clear Moog's was set ablaze in item descriptions, and it's clear Morgoth weaponized his own flaming blood by recanting it, but no other omen fight with blood flame. So, I reckon they both received this blood flame from the Formless Mother. I think the Formless Mother appeared before not just Moog, but Morgoth as well, even though that's never mentioned. Only difference was Moog embraced this power and Morgoth spurned it. Indeed, Morgoth only uses blood flame against us in his boss fight as a last resort. Morgoth's blood flame became a cursed sword that reads, Weapon of Shifting Hue used by Morgoth, the Omen King. The accursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away reformed into this blade. For him to have this, I think, proves that it wasn't just Moog that was approached by the Formless Mother, it was Morgoth as well. They were both underground, assumedly sealed in the same place after all, so I think both of them had their accursed blood set aflame. I think the Mother of Truth, like so many other outer gods attempted to influence a demigod, and I think they failed with Morgoth, but succeeded with Moog. In the end, both Moog and Morgoth weaponized their trauma. For Moog, we can look at the Cursed Blood Pot, for example, which you throw at enemies to douse them in accursed blood, causing summoned spirits to assail them with a rabid fervor, a childhood memory of the Lord of Blood. It's basically saying that Moog remembers being attacked for his accursed blood as a child, and considering the blood specifically motivates spirits to attack, it might be referencing Moog's experience of being haunted by evil spirits. According to the Omen Smirk Mask, evil spirits haunt the Omen in their nightmares, so with this cursed blood pot, now Moog could give others a similar experience. The Mother of Truth craves wounds. She desires bloodshed, swarm of flies, blood boon, blood flame. Everything to do with her is designed to let the blood flow. So the Mother of Truth's base desires are quite simple, but does she want more? Where do her goals end and where do Moog's begin? Well, beyond specifically wanting to empower the accursed, and beyond craving bloodshed, the Mother of Truth doesn't seem to want much. Take Moog's Sacred Spear, for example. It's called an instrument of communion with an outer god, and all it seems to do is pierce the Formless Mother, coating the blade in her blood flame. That's it. That's the communion. What's more, this sacred spear is a design that will come to symbolize his dynasty. Not the Formless Mother's dynasty, Moog's dynasty. 
the formless mother might enable this, but at the end of the day, she is behind Moog's dynasty, but she's not the face of it. So the most you could say, I think, is that she has ambition, yes, but she's not interested in being this god that's worshipped. I think that's very fitting for an outer god, actually. Instead, it's Moog's ambition that we should talk about. And it's Moog's ambition that led him to leave the sewers long ago, probably as soon as he could overpower the shackles that bound him here. This battle you have down here with Moog is actually with an omen illusion, not unlike the fight that you have with Morgoth's illusion. Omen have this ability to conjure illusions, we can sort of infer that from the soundtrack, which calls them omen illusions. Morgoth uses his illusion to hinder the tarnished, his is pretty easy to understand, but it's kind of hard to understand why Moog's illusion is down here, in the sewers. Moog's true location is a bit of a mystery, so maybe he put the illusion here to throw trackers off the scent and sort of pretend that he was still in the sewers? Or did he leave it here to prevent access to the frenzied flame? Because his brother Morgoth does something similar down here after all. This illusion of Moog might even be conjured up by Morgoth, because I just noticed that it seems to erupt into golden particles when it's defeated. Still, it's impossible to know for sure. Anyway, nearby you can find an omen shackle. These shackles have lost most of their power now, and indeed Moog has long escaped the sewers, and not even the all-knowing knows where to find him. But he's here, somewhere underneath the land of Kaled, a so-called Lord of Blood who rules in the ruins of an ancient civilization, which he has decided will be the seat of his coming dynasty. Thrice. This place is drenched in blood, swarming with Moog's servants, and the crumbling palace itself is awash with the formless mother's blood flame. But it was not always this way. The map of Mogwin Palace reads, In the lightless depths lies the cave of an ancient civilization. It is here Moog, the Lord of Blood, is building his palace to be the seat of his coming dynasty named Mogwin. So this ancient civilization existed long before Moog. What was this place? This ancient dynasty isn't given a name but everything here should look very familiar. The underground woodland evokes the one found in Shifra. The statues depict the same bearded figure as the statues in Uld and Ul. These are the remains of an ancient dynasty that can be found all over the lands between. And Moog has very intentionally started to build his dynasty on the remains of their own. Moog calling his rule a dynasty is intentionally evocative of the ancient dynasty. We know about this ancient dynasty because of the oracle bubbles, which are the sorceries of the claymen who served as priests in the ancient dynasty. The description goes on to state, the claymen search for lost oracles within their bubbles. And there's a whole video to be had on this topic, so I won't go too deep into this for now, especially since their culture doesn't really seem relevant to Moog at all. Because I don't think Moog is intent on reviving the old dynasty or continuing it. Rather, item descriptions stress that his is a new dynasty, and if there's anything from the old dynasty that he does use, like the architectural remains of the palace or even possibly the antiquated Latin that he speaks. I feel he might be trying to evoke the old dynasty because he might have envied how widespread the old dynasty was. And I think he wants his dynasty to have this air of legitimacy, something it sorely lacks at the moment. Moog's new dynasty is very different from the old. The swarm of flies incantation sums it up well and reads, the new palace of the Lord of Blood lies in a swamp of festering blood. 
These flies can be cast as a Blood Oath incantation, which are spells directly linked to Moog's own power. But aside from the incantation, these flies also spawn from the blood-tainted excrement that you can loot in this area, which contain dense colonies of tiny eggs of unknown but assuredly revolting origin. The roped fly pot elaborates, stating, The maggots found in waste feed on blood and turn into vicious flies that are pitiably short-lived. Their fangs inflict countless lacerations on the victim, while the grating sound of their wings assails their sanity. And specifically, these flies spawn from the excrement of carnivorous beasts, of which there are now many in the new dynasty, all festering with these bloody pustules and being even tougher than their kin on the surface. So yeah, not a great place. And yet, many disenfranchised beings still seem to choose to reside here, soaking in the festering blood swamp. Which brings us to the Albanorix here. In a way, the Albanorix themselves have a cursed blood, not unlike the Omen. The Albanoric blood clot reads, Albanorics are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Ode Tree's grace. Now, this is just my own speculation, but we know that the formless mother bestows power upon accursed blood. So do you think maybe it's fitting that of all the creatures in this blood-soaked land, many of the Albanorics have found a way to weaponize the blood? I think they've accepted Moog's tainted blood quite well. The Red Albanorics stand apart from their silverkin, who sit dejectedly upon the cliff face. The Red Ones patrol the area and fight with attacks that are actually unique from every other Albanoric in the game. Even their model is a little bit unique, beyond just being red. Look at their heads and you'll see these tiny little omen horns sprouting. Personally, I believe this is because they've been soaking in blood. Specifically, I think they've been tainted by Moog's omen blood. We know from the seedbed curse icon and the dung eater quest line that it's possible to spread omen horns, or at least that horns are an aspect of a defilement that can be spread. So I think that explains why they're sprouting horns here. And there is also evidence that reveals Moog was attempting to share his accursed blood with others. This leads us to Vare and the war surgeons who were abducted by Moog, who wanted to see if they could tame the accursed blood. Quatro! As you enter the Mogwan Palace grounds, three white-robed invaders assail you, one after the other. These are the nameless white masks, and they kind of have fascinating lore to speak of. The white masks wear the War Surgeon gown, which marks them as war surgeons, who were effectively mercy killers. The dagger talisman elaborates, stating that the white-garbed field surgeons come to the aid of friend and foe alike by dealing a final deadly thrust to spare them from the prolonged agony of a mortal wound. So their name is a bit misleading, as there isn't really any surgery occurring here that could save someone's life. Their favorite weapon is the Misericord, a dagger with a name that translates to mercy, and it reads, Dagger favored by military physicians in white, medicine is mercy, and mercy upon the battlefield is ruthless. The White Mask's weapon is found in a storage quarter of Stormvale, and their talisman is found in Volcano Manor, so it's kind of difficult to say which faction they served, if any. After all, they delivered death equally to friend and foe, so they were probably a common sight on the battlefields of the Shattering, regardless of their allegiance. Their choice of white clothing is curious as well. In war, white is the color of truce, which is appropriate for these somewhat neutral characters, and incidentally I think white also shows bloodstains a lot more starkly, and maybe that's why the colour was chosen as well. These characters definitely got their hands dirty as they delivered their mercy, but constantly delivering mercy? 
would eventually cause them to turn depraved. The dagger talisman ends with the line, a sense of mercy is a catalyst for bloodlust, and their weapon warns one to beware the killers clothed as men of compassion. So the war surgeons inevitably developed this taste for blood, and it was this very fact that eventually led to them being targeted and abducted by Moog. The war surgeon gown reads, of the surgeons that were abducted by the Lord of Blood, none were able to tame the accursed blood, none but Vare, that is, though he was an exception. Therefore, the war surgeons, these nameless white masks that assail you in Mogwin Palace, ended up here because they were unexpectedly abducted by the Lord of Blood. This reveals that Moog was searching for potentates who might be able to control the accursed blood that he had been graced with. It's more proof that he was looking to share his accursed blood with others. And considering these surgeons now invade on behalf of Moog, it seems clear that they were happy on some level to have this new violent outlet for their bloodlust. Though only one of their number actually manages to tame the accursed blood as Moog desired, and that's Vare. But what does that really mean? to tame the accursed blood. Well, earlier we speculated that the Albanorix are growing horns because they've been doused not just in blood, but in Moog's accursed omen blood. And I really do think that there's a lot of evidence that Moog is trying to find worthy recipients who can tame his essence. Because instead of the phrase tame the accursed blood, the original Japanese actually says something a bit closer to accept. The accursed blood. Which brings me to this interaction with Vare, where he gives you a wound and you accept what is assumedly Moog's noble blood. Give me your finger. This noble blood will be an immutable badge of honor once it settles inside of you. Oh, good heavens. Clench your teeth or something. The bloody finger item, which is your finger, I might add, reads, glistening blood has been siphoned into the nail of this finger. Its sickly pale skin feels nothing now, but the nail still aches with the sweetest pain. Never forget that feeling of agony, for it is what binds you to Luminary Moog, to all of us. With a fresh infusion of this accursed, noble blood, you can invade other tarnished and sate your bloodlust, materializing out of blood in other worlds, just like Moog does. But that's not the only way that you can invade with what is assumedly Moog's blood. You can also do so with a festering bloody finger. These are consumable items, and they're not your finger this time and three of them are given to you by Vare, and he gives them to you as a test of sorts. Oh, I have a gift for you, something fit only for the wise, a means for circumventing the draw of the two fingers. Give it a try, won't you? Vare is hoping that you'll use these to fuel a bloodlust of your own, thereby distracting you from the allure of the two fingers who have other plans for you, as a tarnished. And if you prove this bloodlust to Vare, you'll be inducted into their order, and you'll have blood infused into you, perhaps as he and other war surgeons once received. Hmm, I knew it from the very start. You have a taste for noble blood. As opposed to the bloody finger you can receive, these consumable, festering bloody fingers are blackened with blood congestion. And if you look closely, what looked like omen horns appear to be writhing at the end, reinforcing the idea again that it's Moog's accursed blood that had been injected into these fingers before they were cut off. The description goes on to state that these festering fingers have been chopped off rather unceremoniously. The lack of ceremony indicates a measure of disappointment with the owner of these fingers, I think. And that's why I think these fingers once belonged to other inductees, just like the nameless war surgeons 
who failed to accept the infusion of Moog's blood. Note this dialogue from Vare if you deny him. You will die nameless without ceremony. So the nameless war surgeons are likely also those whose fingers were unceremoniously chopped off, it seems. There, a warning of what could happen to you if you listen to Vare's speech, which is enticing in its splendor, but full of deadly consequence. Despite this harsh treatment of his subjects, Moog is different to the Two Fingers, according to Vare, at least, and one of the key differences, apparently, is love. In his dialogue, Vare laments that the Two Fingers have no love for the Tarnished, but Moog does, he says. Incidentally, the Tarnished are kind of related to Moog via Godfrey, in a way. We're all of the same bloodline, so I guess it is true that we are at least somewhat alike. Vare really is very loyal to Moog, and indeed amongst all the war surgeons, Vare is actually the only one that's capable of encanting Blood Flame Blade, a spell that coats his weapon with what we know is the essence of the Formless Mother. Vare has been granted strength beyond any other character in Moog's dynasty, it seems, and Vare is, no doubt, eventually very disappointed in you when you teleport to the palace early, before the new dynasty has even begun. This is what leads to an optional confrontation with Vare and his death. Oh, luminary Moog, please grant the strength you promised. I have given everything. You can teleport to Mogwin Palace early with the Pure Blood Knight's Medal, which is something Vare gives you if you prove yourself to him. I've gone out of my way to provide one to you, but you mustn't use it just yet. The meeting must wait until the Mogwin Dynasty commences. Luminary Moog yet slumbers beside the divinity. Now that we've been inducted, we start to see Moog's luminary vision and can learn how Mogwin Dynasty is supposed to come about. The Lord of Blood's exaltation talisman explains, reading, render up your offerings of blood to your Lord, drench my consort's chamber, slake his cocoon's thirst. His awakening shall herald the dawn of our dynasty. So he's specifically saying that others should make offerings to Mikola, and I think the ones he's telling to make the offerings would be his bloody fingers. By invading and killing, I think we might just be making offerings of others. And I think also these offerings would be made by the sanguine nobles, who are just as aggressive as the bloody fingers are if you find them out in the open world. For example, this is one of many sanguine nobles, and you fight them here at the Rose Church in Leonia. It's likely named after the Blood Rose, which is an item deeply related to all things bloody. And the building itself is a sort of parish. It's a church that operates in a foreign land, and it's no coincidence that it's here that Vare attempts to recruit you. In fact, the enemy inside the church is supposedly a recruiter as well, although I kind of question their recruiting techniques. The sanguine noble hood is worn by nobles who serve the Lord of Blood, and reads, known to strike from pools of blood, these assassins are missionaries, come to share the gospel of accursed blood. Just like the Red Albanorix, the sanguine nobles have started to grow omen horns, and their rank seems to exceed that of the Albanorix, as can be inferred by the noble in Mogwin Palace, who stands before a crowd of Albanorix. Again, rather than being true omen, I think this is another instance where being infused with Mog's accursed blood has led to their horns growing, a cursed blessing, as the Dung Eater would say. Their robes go on to read, the grand metallic pattern on the shoulder is a signifier of the noble rank they intend to claim upon the advent of the new dynasty they are working to install. 
and their weapons are designed to rip the flesh with sickening efficacy, suggesting that they really are working to install this new dynasty via the blood loss of others, making offerings for Mikola's cocoon. And again, I think the Bloody Fingers are the same way. Yura calls the Bloody Fingers tarnished, held in thrall by cessblood, zealots who stalk their own. If it isn't Narius, the Bloody Finger, the end is nigh for you. Yura is familiar with many such Bloody Fingers, none more so than Eleonora, who is the one he loves and she's the one who he considers to be the deadliest bloody finger of all. I'm dying to see you, Eleonora. Violet bloody finger. In the end, though, Eleonora kills Yura here at the Second Church of Marika. And this church is interesting, because despite being a Church of Marika, there's clearly been an attempt by Moog's adherents to usurp it. Note the Blood Roses, the Sanguine Noble who appears here, the Hound here festering with blood, and of course Eleonora herself. Eleonora is one of Moog's bloody fingers, the most dangerous of them all, if Yura is to be believed. Perhaps it's for this reason that Moog might have entrusted her with the Purifying Crystal Tear, an item that can nullify the effect of Moog's Rite of Blood attack. Either that, or she has somehow procured this purifying crystal tear because she has a secret plan to attack Moog. You could definitely speculate in that direction as well, I think, if you wanted to. Eleonora wields a twinned Naginata, a weapon that's forged in the Land of Reeds, which is a place locked in civil war that has become alienated from the culture of its neighbors. Little wonder it is said that the entire nation has succumbed to blood-soaked madness. It's on this note that I'd again like to return to the description of Formless Erden in Bloodborne, specifically the part that says both Erden and Erden's inadvertent worshippers surreptitiously seek the precious blood. Earlier we established that Erden and the Formless Mother clearly have some overlap, and I speculate that this overlap could extend to Erden's inadvertent worshippers as well. Inadvertent means unintentional or accidental worship in this context, and I think that the Formless Mother might have many, many children, because I think you can make a good case for her having many inadvertent worshippers of her own. After all, the blood-soaked madness of the Land of Reeds has led more than one of their number directly to Moog. Introducing Okina, who is a demon of a swordsman. His bloodlust led him into combat with Moog himself, and his sword tells of this story, stating, When Moog, the Lord of Blood, first felt Okina's sword and madness upon his flesh, he had a proposal to offer Okina the life of a demon, whose thirst would never go unsated. So it was that Okina became a bloody finger of Moog, cutting down his enemies with rivers of blood, a cursed sword which has felled countless men. Weapons like these are really powerful when paired with the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman, which gives you an attack boost if blood loss is triggered in the vicinity, and one amazing little lore detail is that this Captain of Godric actually gets the attack power buff whenever there's blood loss nearby, hinting that he's actually carrying the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman, and that he is thus an adherent of Moog. The weapon art he uses, Bloody Slash, also suggests as much, as it is a Blood Oath skill granted by the Lord of Blood, so it seems this Stormvale captain has either defected or is secretly loyal to Moog, or he has a dual allegiance. I love that it's left open to your interpretation. The talisman itself is dropped by Esgar, a priest of blood found in the catacombs below Lane Dell, the same place where Moog first met the Mother of Truth. He wears the robes of an adherent of Moog, 
except for his great hood, which reads, a burial shroud of sorts, for those who discover, at long last, the truth they sought. I think this could be hinting that Esgar found the mother of truth here below, but it's hard to say for sure. Speaking of which, it's unclear if Moog has ever shared the fact that he communes with the formless mother at all. Most worship of her appears to be really indirect, and bloodshed for the sake of bloodshed seems reason enough for her, and those that perform it as well. Perhaps it's for this reason that the all-knowing casts doubt on Moog's title, calling him the so-called Lord of Blood. Oh, so that's where the so-called Lord of Blood was hiding himself, eh? Perhaps this lack of clarity about Moog's rule is why even item descriptions cast doubt on Moog, who is the reigning lord and hierarch of the coming dynasty of Moguen, or perhaps a raving lunatic. After all, can blood offerings really lead to the awakening of Mikola? The remembrance of the Blood Lord does state that no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Empyrean. But Moog needs Mikola to awaken. Because Moog doesn't just want to be a ruler, he wants legitimacy in the eyes of the world. And since Mikola is an Empyrean eligible to be the god of this world, he could give Moguen a legitimacy that might match even the Golden Order, which is structured in a similar way. It has a lord and a god at the forefront. So it's time to finally talk about Mikola, for if he does awaken, then it's very likely that this will lead to the coming dynasty named Moguen, and whatever nightmares that may bring. Queen Quay. Whatever nightmares that may bring is an extremely ominous line, especially considering Mikola has a dreaming alter ego. So to explain that quickly, like many other characters in the game, Mikola has a duality to his character. On one hand, you have Mikola, the unalloyed who helped his sister resist the effects of the Scarlet Rot, who grew a home for the low and the meek, and who is cursed with eternal youth. But then, on the other hand, Mikola is also Saint Trina, a mysterious character that has powers relating to sleep and dreams. The symbol of their faith is this, Trina's Lily, which dulls the senses, preventing agitation. And it's no coincidence that this lily is shaped just like Mikola's lily, for the nascent Mikola is Saint Trina, or they're moonlighting as them in their dreams, so to speak. And whatever Saint Trina has been doing, it's made a really good impression on a great many people. The Lands Between is a pretty harrowing place, after all, and to get relief, it seems some people have turned to Saint Trina, whose lilies help them get away from it all. Priests of Saint Trina also exist, crafting sleep arrows to spread their teachings. The sweet oblivion of sleep, can become quite the habit. Another such item is the sleep pot, which says, like a lullaby or a quagmire, its light purple haze irresistibly draws its victims down into sleep. Sweet dreams. Incidentally, the word lullaby brings to mind another piece of cut content to do with Mikola, where the red-eyed merchants were once taught the song that they play in their tomb by a mysterious figure. And Fittingly, St. Trina's full cut name is St. Trina of the Cradle Song, which connects them to the merchant's song. In Cut Merchant Dialogue, it's stated that the one who sang for them now sings no longer. The singer is missing, just like St. Trina, because the one who sang was St. Trina. And we don't really have to just rely on cut content to tell us of that fact, an item called Favor's Cookbook suggests that Saint Trina is missing as well, as it is a record of crafting techniques left by a man who was utterly captivated by Saint Trina. He continued the search for her in his slumber, 
So he was searching for her because St. Trina went missing. Also, St. Trina's sword reads, St. Trina is an enigmatic figure. Some say she is a comely young girl, others are sure he is a boy. The only certainty is that their appearance was as sudden as their disappearance. So St. Trina went missing. And returning to cut dialogue, we also learn about a character called Rico, a cut NPC who claims to be Mikola's humble servant, and who we believe finds Mikola's body at Moog's palace. Here, Rico states, Finally, I have found it. St. Trina, no, Lord Mikola's cadaver. I have partaken of untold secrets, such that I may aid you, O Lord. So please, I hope you welcome your humble servant, Rico, into your dream, the world of your heart. So, Rico believed that he was finally going to be able to aid Mikola and enter his dream, now that he'd found him in the physical world. Before the DLC trailer was revealed, I would have said, yeah, I reckon the DLC will take us to Mikola's dream world. It sounds like the perfect place for DLC, right? But now, with the recent trailer, it can't be that simple. Because the interviews featured in my DLC video make it quite clear that Mikola's cadaver will instead take us to the Land of Shadow, a place that was once physically a part of the Lands Between before it was veiled and obscured by Queen Marika. In that video, we speculated that the Land of Shadow might be a place where the dead go. We speculated that it might be a kind of afterlife, or at least it might have once been a sort of afterlife before the Erd Tree sort of took over that role. We reason this because Mikola is said to have divested himself of his flesh to get there. The poem reads, it was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. Of course, we don't yet know the true nature of the Land of Shadow, but it is kind of fitting for Saint Trina, of all people, to have died to arrive in this place, because death in Elden Ring has long been linked to sleep. For example, when Roger succumbs to Deathroot, he says this, Lately, I feel I'm on the precipice of falling into a deep, fathomless slumber, and I have an inkling it could spell trouble for you somehow. Roger is almost hinting that he might be a threat in some realm beyond sleep, and he's kind of right, because later we do find Roger, or a part of his vitality at least, which has been weaponized by fear. We do this inside of Godwin's deathbed dream, a phrase that obviously has sleep connotations as well. So I wonder, with death being so linked to sleep, could Mikola have planned this death in his own slumber so that he could travel to the Land of Shadow? One piece of evidence for Mikola's death being a sort of deep sleep could be the slumbering egg, which is an owl egg that will never hatch, prized as a symbol of the most sublime slumber. The egg is this powerful parallel to the situation with Mikola's cocoon. Mikola's cocoon was taken by Moog before it was ready to hatch. Just so, this egg is looted from killing an owl, and thus is also taken before it was ready to hatch, perhaps before it was even ready to be born. The owl inside will never hatch, it's essentially dead, and this egg's description reminds us that this state of death is the most sublime slumber there is. So I conclude that there's a strong parallel between the slumbering egg and Mikola's cocoon. Touching the arm that extends out of the cocoon will bring us to the land of shadow where Mikola traveled long before us. As per the IGN interview, Miyazaki states that players will be following in Mikola's footsteps in the same way that they followed the blessings of the Sites of Grace in the Lands Between. And of course the player is not the only one who is curious about Mikola. There are several other characters in the world and NPCs who have been following Mikola as well. And the player will encounter them on their journey in the Land of Shadow, and they will make new friends and enemies, we hope. Fittingly, Mikola does have many followers, so does Saint Trina, and 
while no one seems to know for sure where they disappeared to, it is rumoured. Gideon's dialogue reveals that he suspected Mikola was with the Lord of Blood, and there's even a phantom in the consecrated snowfield who points towards Mogwin Palace's waygate, and they died knowing exactly who took Mikola as well. And then of course there's Rico, that cut content character who senses their master needs their aid. Indeed, St. Trina and Mikola seem to live on beyond the death of their flesh. And while the Land of Shadow might not literally be the dream world that many expected it to be, there is evidence that St. Trina's presence has been felt here. For example, this is St. Trina's Lily in the base game. It looks a bit sad, right? It only has a tiny hint of purple left. So this is why I wonder, could this Lily in the background be a true Lily of St. Trina? It does appear to be more whole, and it appears in a sort of quagmire of sleep here. There's that signature purple sleep hue, and there's a masked character who is slumbering in this place. Incidentally, another thing I missed was that you can actually spy some lilies in the background of this fight as well. So perhaps this boss is linked to St. Trina? But I digress. Mikola's actions are becoming clearer to us, but that still leaves Moog. First up, how did Moog manage to abduct Mikola? Well, earlier we talked about how Moog abducted the war surgeons, presumably to test the accursed blood on them, so already Moog has a bit of a history of abduction, and if he can materialize from blood anywhere, like this cutscene suggests, and like his sanguine nobles and bloody fingers seem able to do, well, that would certainly explain how abducting Mikola was relatively easy for him, especially if Melania was away fighting Radan at the time. So during Mikola's abduction, he was ripped out of the tree. There's clearly a large gap here in the tree-like woman's form, almost as if this figure was pregnant with Mikola. And indeed, Mikola sits atop a giant pelvis bone in Moog's palace, showing just how wholesale he was ripped from the Halig tree itself. The Mother of Truth desires a wound, indeed. So we know what happened, but why? Why did Moog think abducting Mikola was a good idea? Sense. for that one. Moog believed Mikola could have transitioned from Empyrean to God. Maybe even Mikola believed that he could. And I think Moog wanted to take advantage of this process and take advantage of the new God that would soon rise. The remembrance of the Blood Lord reads, wishing to raise Mikola to full godhood, Moog wished to become his consort taking the role of monarch, but no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Imperium. The wording of bedchamber is appropriate considering Moog is trying to consort with Mikola and become his lord, so to speak, and it being a bloody bedchamber is appropriate too, as items state that Moog slumbers beside the divinity and the cutscene seems to be suggesting that Moog slumbers inside of Mikola's blood. Also, it's very fitting that they use the word slumber here. Dearest Mikola, you must abide alone a while. So if Moog becomes his consort, then Moog will become a lord of sorts not unlike the dynamic with the Elden Lord that has existed throughout history, where they become consort to their god. But the real question that remains is, how exactly does Mikola become a god in this situation? Considering Mikola's positioning in the womb of this giant tree-like woman, it's easy to assume that what he was attempting was a sort of rebirth here. And this brings me back to Rico's dialogue, the final part, where he says, Indeed, I beg you grant my wish, that when you transcend from Empyrean to God, allow me a place by your side. I wonder, 
What if the cocoon was part of this transition? It reminds me a lot of Berserk, which Miyazaki is endlessly inspired by, and spoiler alert if you haven't yet seen it, but a certain character here also achieves a similar transition inside an egg, turning from human to a god of sorts. To become a part of the God Hand in this moment and achieve his dream, Griffith has to make a sacrifice, and in the end, he chooses to betray his companions, branding them and sealing their fate. In my Mikola video, we draw a few parallels between Mikola and Griffith, and if Mikola is inspired by Griffith as much as I think, then that could be quite concerning, as there is a part of Melania's storyline as well that also seems to be setting up some betrayal to come, although that is of course just speculation. This is probably a good time to talk about the fact that Mikola does have some very ominous overtones to their character. For starters, Saint Trina has an adult form, and it's a one-eyed creature with this spooky mass of elevated hair that is carved upon Saint Trina's torch. What's more, remember Saint Trina's sleep fog draws others down into sleep against their will. Sleep is a weapon. Saint Trina's sword makes that even more clear, as does Cut Content, which states, the saint of the cradle song has become the very symbol of lost repose, and the feeble of heart were powerless to resist her kindness, even upon the battlefield. So in Cut Content, at least, the saint of the cradle song actually fought in certain wars with kindness. So that description mentions Saint Trina's weaponized kindness, and so does this line from the trailer. Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. There is nothing more terrifying. Melania also calls Mikola the most fearsome Empyrean of all. And lastly, the common soldiers of the Halig Tree discovered a bitter truth as they awaited their Lord's return to the Halig Tree. They discovered that Mikola's sacred light would trigger them to self-destruct in their final moments. But even so, they remained loyal, and I quote, May the flash of our deaths guide Mikola's return. So in conclusion, it's for these reasons that I'm a bit concerned about this scary, dreaming demigod and about the nightmares that might be incurred by Moog's ritual with him inside the cocoon. A part of me wonders if the formless mother was supposed to be a part of Mikola's ascension to God, considering the ritual happening in Mogwin Palace. That would fit because a few gods we see in Elden Ring do have an outer god as a patron of sorts. Melania has the Outer God of Rot, and she is destined to become the Goddess of Rot. Marika becomes a vessel for the Elden Ring, and she is the God of the Greater Will, who is almost certainly an Outer God as well. So all of that sort of answers how Mikola might become a God, as best we can, considering how abstract the game is with these terms. My next question is though, did Mikola foresee any of this happening? The Bewitching Branch is an item that can pierce a foe and turn them into a temporary ally, and it reads, The Empyrean Mikola is loved by many people. Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. The wording here is kind of sinister, right? The fact that Mikola is capable of consciously compelling affection in order to get what he wants is very manipulative. And if Mikola is capable of masterminding others' affections, who's to say he hasn't done the same with Moog? Moog's infatuation with Mikola is very obvious and very cursed, considering Mikola's eternal youth and the fact that Mikola is technically Moog's half brother. Again, I'm reminded of this scene with Griffith from Berserk, where Griffith spends a night with a powerful, perverted older man for money, which he needs to achieve his own goals. The man, Genon, is obsessed with Griffith, but to Griffith, Genon is nothing more than a stone lying on the side of the path he walks, and Griffith eventually discards him as such. In my Mikola video, we talked about just how much overlap there is between the characters of Mikola and Griffith, 
And so I just can't shake the feeling that Mikola might be using Moog here. But if that's true, why? What would Mikola stand to gain from masterminding this entire situation where he ends up dead and defiled? Before the DLC trailer dropped, I had imagined that Mikola's arm would take us into Mikola's dream world, and so I thought that Mikola might stand to benefit or suffer thanks to Moog's actions upon his slumbering form. I thought he might have even been co-opting the formless mother for his ascension into a god. But now, from what we understand about the DLC trailer, the Land of Shadow is a place distinct from Mikola, so the answer becomes different. We know Mikola divested himself of his flesh and grace to get here, so it's harder to imagine that the bloody rituals happening in Mogwen are having any effect on Mikola's self. Moog really might not be getting any response from Mikola for good reason. So I'm going to present one new theory on why Mikola might benefit from being here, based on the information we have from the DLC trailer, and it's this. So. We know Mikola divested himself of his flesh before reaching the Land of Shadow, right? And we know that he also divested himself of his grace to get here. He divested himself of his lineage, of all things golden. Divesting yourself of your flesh is hard enough, but divesting yourself of your grace is also difficult. Rani has difficulty with this in her questline. She divests herself of her flesh finally, but even then she's still linked to the two fingers and has to kill them to be freed completely. So what if Moog was instrumental not just to the process of Mikola dying, but the process of Mikola losing his grace as well? What if by being doused in accursed blood, Mikola was defiled to the point that grace left him fully? We know that those doused in Moog's accursed blood start to grow omen horns, and the omen are graceless, and we know that being defiled is something that many people in the lands between fear. The Dung Eater is proof of that. We talked earlier about how they defile people, and how those people are terrified of what this means for them, and their rebirth. So it is that I think that Mikola might have wanted to die in this manner, to fall into this state of sublime slumber, and also to be defiled to the point where Grace leaves him. But that's just a theory, and of course, we don't have all of the pieces of the story yet, and I think it's impossible to say for sure which direction his story will go. I think this state of speculation is very much exactly where From Software wants us to be at this point. Even the all-knowing doesn't know what's going on here. So Mikola was with the Lord of Blood after all. That is some fine intelligence indeed. Well, I wonder what comes next. If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all would be well. But perhaps it would be safer to destroy it. Nicola is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. So, what do you think? Did Mikola anticipate being taken from the Halig Tree? Will he be affected by the Lord of Blood's machinations? Moog certainly believes so. In fact, Moog believes this even beyond the very moment of his death. I can see it as clear as day. The coming of our dynasty. Morgwin. Before I go, let me tell you a little story about a game that was scheduled to release on June 21st. So this is Enotria a Souls-like title inspired by Italian folklore and history, which gives it an extremely unique vibe. For example, this is Quinta, the game's opening area, rendered gorgeously in Unreal Engine 5 here. I love the verticality in these scenes, I think there's going to be so much level design they can play with there, and I was very excited to explore this Mediterranean world. But then, Elden Ring announced its DLC, for the same day as their release. Oof. Luckily, however, I've heard they're announcing a new release date soon. Now, I don't usually take Souls-like sponsorships unless it's something I've played and loved, but since the devs for this game weren't strict on what I had to say here, I decided to take this one 
because they're clearly happy for their product to speak for itself, and I think that kind of confidence is awesome. Their gameplay trailer mentions huge skill trees, spells, buffs, passives, and a special type of equipment called masks, which are at the center point of each loadout. They've also said that they've spent a lot of time getting the motion capture for animations right, which is potentially the most important thing for a Souls-like for me, and their gameplay system also builds in something called chainable parries, which reminds me a lot of Sekiro, which I love. So, if you like what you see, consider following some of their pages, or even pre-ordering. You can learn more over at Enotria the Last Song slash pre-order, or you can click the links in the description. Thanks guys.